Welcome back to another video this is a part 7 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 25, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 25, Morning Serial. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan. Sona and Tsubaki both look at one another and then back toward Yasaka and Issei. Sona then manages to speak up after her bout of shock from Yusaka's earlier comment. Does your, fox magic, require you to hold Hyoto into your, erm, ch, chest like that? Sona was doing the best she could to only look into the fox queen's eyes where her own seemed to wander downward uncontrollably. Tsubaki was a bit shocked at her president's bold and somewhat accusative question toward the Yukai queen. Adjusting her green-rimmed glasses, the taller Tree queen turned her full attention onto Yusaka, wondering how she would react to such a comment. Yusaka raises an eyebrow as she pushes Issei's sleeping face, deeper into the crevice of her generous cleavage. Now showing an obvious smirk, the fox queen replies, Era, no, not really. I just enjoy having him right here. Does that bother you, my little dearest? Sona begins to puff her cheeks out in anger, once again. Tsubaki notices this and places her supportive hand on Sona's shoulder. President, perhaps we should take baths ourselves. After all, it is getting late. Sona looks at Tsubaki with a confused yet mildly irritated glance. What on earth are you talking about, Tsubaki? Sona finds herself being pulled closer to her queen as Tsubaki lowers her head and whispers into the Citri heiress's ear. She said that Hyoto won't be awake until morning. Also, you don't want to leave him alone with Yasaka-san. This is the only logical course of action. Immediately, Sona knew that Tsubaki was correct in everything. Nodding back at her queen with a smile of acknowledgement, Sona now turns her attention toward Yasaka, who is looking at the two with humorous suspicion. Yasaka-sama, I think we will take you up on your kind offer. Indeed the water looks very inviting. The fox queen's smirk now turns into a forced smile. I see. Well then, please, enjoy. Yasaka was hoping that she might have a few more hours of alone time with her new, patient, however the Citri sister along with her queen seemed to want to put an end to that rather quickly. Scene ORC. We see Rias laying on one of the couches with an ice pack against her forehead. Her olive green jumpsuit was covered in stains of all different colors not to mention her red hair was completely frizzed out in all directions. Dark circles were present underneath the bloodshot and blue eyes of the exhausted-looking Grimori heiress. Sitting at Rias's desk was none other than Grafia. She was staring coldly at her sister-in-law as she recrossed her legs. I will say this one more time, Rias. There are no ghosts in this school. So whatever you have planned when it comes to me taking it easy on you, forget about it. Don't think that I have forgiven you for using your power in such an abusive and manipulative way. Trying to scare your pawn like that, pfft, unacceptable. Rias sits up while looking back toward Grafia. She now has a look of sheer anger. That's not fair. Yes, I was mean to Issei. Yes, I deserve my punishment. And yes, I will apologize to Issei after all is said and done. I, I am really sorry about this and I will make it right. Grafia now grins. Really now, Rias tilts her head. What's that supposed to mean? Let's just say that I have it on good authority that the Citri Peerage was considering your threat involving the trading of your pawn. As in, they are more than likely willing to make you an offer, assuming you hold true to your threat that is. Rias's anger turns into rage. No, no, no. I wasn't intending on trading Issei. Wait, how do they know about this? Seraphal. Damn it. Grafia. I. Didn't mean. Words have consequences, Rias especially words that have power behind them. Regardless of what you might have intended, it was how you conveyed it that caused the problem. This is serious Rias, imagine if you were to take over your brother's position and make idle threats such as these. You would have half of the underworld plotting on dethroning your spoiled ass before you could recite each level of hell. Grafia now took a deep breath. Rias thought about her sister-in-law's words. Aside from the, spoiled ass, comment, Grafia was right in the end. Words with power behind them. Instead of protesting, Rias simply slumped back into the couch. Yeah, okay, I see, 
Seeing this serious reaction to her words, Graphia's grin turned into her usual stoic frown. Let's get some tea and call it an evening. Tomorrow we have the track and field that needs landscaping. Rias nods as the two leave the main room together. The ice pack that was originally on Rias's forehead was now on the coffee table near the couch. The moment the orc doors shut, the ice pack explodes. Ha 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 ha, Rias, I want to play some more, wahahaha. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Sona and Issei's guest bedroom. Alright, help me lower him, President. We can see Subaki, in a bath towel, as she is lowering a sleeping Issei from over her shoulder. Sona, also in a bath towel, then helps while reaching the for the teen's shoulder as the two lay him into the futon. After all was said and done, both girls look at each other. Sona then smiles. Thank you, Subaki, for having my back in all of this. Tusbaki stands up and bows slightly before opening the rice paper door. It's not a problem, President. As the sliding door shut once Subaki left, all went quiet. Sona looked toward a smiling and sleeping Issei, hoping that the fox was at least telling the truth about one thing. Maybe she was helping him on a more spiritual level, something her sister continued to imply since they arrived in Kyoto. Well, at least maybe they could spend some time tomorrow, after all, even if they didn't leave the castle grounds, there was always that garden out back. Sona then began to imagine a picnic scene. Deciding that perhaps that would suffice as their first date, the Citri heiress began to plan the day accordingly as she tucked into the futon with Issei after tossing her towel to the side. Sandwiches, drinks and some snacks. I can easily prepare such things as my cooking skills are negligible at best. Sona then placed her glasses toward the small end table next to the bed and proceeded to snuggle closer to her boyfriend. Deciding that he needed to be cleansed of Yusaka's touch, Sona proceeded to pull Issei's head into her bare and ample chest. Blushing, the sea tree devil closed her violet eyes and drifted off into a deep sleep. Scene, early morning, Yusaka castle, guest room. Opening his eyes, Issei immediately knew where he was. The warmth, the sound of her breathing, the slight hint of lavender from her skin, this was Sona. Once he pulled back a bit, Issei's face met the cold morning air of the bedroom. Damn, this woman spoils me. I love it. Looking down at the sleeping heiress, Issei slowly removed Sona's leg from his midsection while making a clean getaway without waking her. Once he found his slippers, the teen slowly and quietly opened and shut the sliding door. Once he placed his slippers over his feet, Issei could hear music down the hallway. It was one of the opening theme songs to, Milky Spiral. Curious, Issei walked down the corridor and toward a large and open living space. This had to be the main den or family room as it was comfy and cozy. Littered with soft-looking Japanese-style seating, along with a large television monitor, Issei found it to be. Both very traditional yet modern looking at the same time. Speaking of the television, Milky Spiral, was indeed playing. As Issei looked for any inhabitants of this room, he saw nothing, that was until he looked down and toward the matted floor. Next to the TV, on the ground was little Kuno. She was wearing a pair of Milky Chan brand pajamas while eating a bowl of sugary looking cereal. Issei caught himself getting emotionally committed to the episode that was being played. Kunuo then turned her head as her eyes grew bright in yellow stars. Issei Kun, bits of cereal flew out of the little fox princess's mouth. You wanna watch Milky with me? Mommy is still sleeping just like all of the grown-ups. Issei pointed at himself while smiling nervously. Really? Um, sure, okay. Issei sat down on the floor, as Kuno patted a spot next to her. At first it was quiet, that was until Issei remembered some key facts about this specific episode. Before he knew it, the two were talking about every detail regarding the lore and characters within all of, Milky Spiral. This went on for about 45 minutes. Issei-kun, Kunuo-chan, good morning. Kuno and Issei turn their heads at Seraphal. She looks to have a serious case of bed head as she continuously yawns. Once she saw what the two were up to, she instantly charged up all of her energy and released it all in one single dash. Making a very quick gallop toward Issei, Seraphal proceeded to then jump into the air while making a somersault and then ending in a perfect landing, which happened to be Issei's lap. Plop. Kuno looks over toward Seraphal while smiling. Yup, we are watching your show, Aunt Milky. 
Issei was telling me about how you took out the evil pandy thief prince with the power of true love. I only remembered some bits and pieces, but the Red Knight knows so much stuff. Seraphal turns her head upward while looking into Issei's eyes, upside down. Still smiling, Seraphal replies. Oh, so you are the princesses, Red Knight, are you? How adorable. Seraphal begins to jump up and down on Issei's lap as she begins to giggle. Can you imagine, he he he, if Issei here, was in my television show. Ha ha ha, I can see it now, Issei Hyodo, the Red Dragon Knight, valiant hero to aid Milky in her heroic adventures. Now that would be something, wouldn't it? Kuno now began to get very excited at the notion. Wow, Issei-kun would be amazing. Though, Aunt Milky, you would have to slow the cameras down, otherwise we couldn't see the Red Knight actually do anything. Issei begins to scratch the back of his head. Ha ha ha, not to mention the passing out part. Seraphal's smile now turns into a solid frown. Kuno also seems to lose her excitement while beginning to frown herself. Seeing this, Issei swallows a large gulp. What did I say to ruin the mood? Seraphal looks behind her shoulder and back at Issei again. She looks very serious, even though her face is upside down from Issei's point of view. I don't want you to use that anymore, not until you can transform into your balance breaker, naturally. It can't be good for you to, overboost, like that all of the time. Boo, no, no, you are too important to be so reckless. Before anything else could be said, another person entered the room very quietly. Good morning Kuno, Sarah-chan and Issei-kun, era era. Yasaka was now standing in the corridor with a cup of hot coffee in one hand and a folded newspaper in the other. She was wearing a white evening gown with pink cherry blossoms as her smile continued to grow. I see you are all watching, Milky Spiral Adventures, I am sure my daughter is very happy to have company as she performs her favorite morning activity. Issei, still with Seraphal on his lap, smiles back at Yasaka. Good morning, Yasaka-sama, I didn't get a chance to thank you last night but, Yasaka clears her throat suddenly as she sits down on the couch next to the three sitting on the floor. What did we talk about, when it came to my name and honorifics, Issei-kun? Taking a large and nervous gulp as both Seraphal and Kuno looked back at him with smirks, Issei replies. I am sorry about that, Yusaka. Smiling brighter than ever, Yusaka nods as she opens the newspaper to the horoscope section. After a few moments, the three go back to watching their television program as Yusaka turns the newspaper page. Meanwhile, the Fox Queen keeps one eye on the interaction between her daughter and Issei. He looks to be a natural father figure. My sweet Kuno has clearly taken quite a liking to my, erm, the boy. Yasaka goes back to reading the horoscopes as she spots Ares. I see, so Issei-kun is going to experience a great change. Well, this reading is not wrong, fufufu. Oh, let's look at mine, hum, ah Aquarius. Yes, oh, indeed. So I will also experience a great change during this spring day. This is fun, let's check compatibility now. Era era, Aries and Aquarius are very compatible. Well then, my mind is made up. Seraphal, Issei and Kuno all jumped the moment Sona came out from nowhere as she just appeared in the corridor. Ehim, instantly, the Maulaviathan proceeded to purposely wriggle around on A, nervously smiling Issei's lap. Seraphal had a malicious grin as she was staring directly at her grumpy looking sister. Oh no, Boo, it's the mean Satan, Issei, I'm so scared, protect me. Seraphal now pretended to cry as she reached around, now straddling Issei, as she then proceeded to grab his head with both of her arms. Oh no, your Milky Chan is so terrified by the evil student council president Chan. As Issei is now being crushed by Seraphal's arms, not to mention her breasts that were squeezing the boy's suffocating face, all the teen could do was take advantage of the mouse bouncing around as he was able to take quick gasps of air in between jiggles. Kuno then pointed toward an even more angry Sona. While scowling, the little fox princess made a declaration. Aunt Milky, you should also have her, in one of your episodes, as a villainous. Sona's jaw went agape. Hearing Kuno's words, Issei couldn't help but muffle laugh at the situation. Seraphal also laughed heartily at the suggestion. Ha 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 ha, oh, ha 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 ha. Yes Kuno, that would be incredible all in itself. 
Seraphal now imagined Sona wearing some evil villainous outfit with maybe an eye patch or perhaps a scar. PFF. Ha 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 ha. Looking down, Seraphal let Issei have a bit of oxygen. Imagine her with an eye patch, like a pirate or something cute like that. Issei began to burst out laughing again, however Seraphal grinned and tightened her shoulders which muffled the teen once again. Meanwhile, Yasaka looked toward Seraphal, then her daughter and now she had her attention directed on Sona. Era era, come now, Kuno, Seraphal, I believe you two have gone too far. It's far too early in the morning for such shenanigans. Sona Chan, please come sit over here next to me, I will have some tea brought. The grown ups should enjoy the morning with a bit of grace. Yasaka then winks toward a flustered looking Sona. At some point during Yasaka's words, Issei managed to squirm his way out from Seraphal's rather impressive booby traps. This was due to the Mao being distracted as she looked toward Yusaka with a childish sad face. Boo, I am grown up. I just like to play. What's wrong with that? Kuno claps along and joins in with her aunt. Mommy doesn't understand. She is all about being proper and stuff. It gets so boring sometimes. Yusaka shakes her head. One day, you will understand, young. One. Also, Seraphal, please release Issei-kun and stop antagonizing your sister. Sona's eyes lit up, seeing the shining example of order and prosperity, all in one package. How did she not see this before? Whenever this woman did anything, there was a certain grace to it all. And now, to see someone who has the power to reprimand Seraphal of all people. As Seraphal grumpily got off of Issei's lap, she had both of her front cheeks puffed out. Sona grew a small smirk seeing this as she proceeded to take Yusaka's offer and sit next to her. Chapter 26, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 26, Nerding Out to Milky Spiral. Scene, Yusaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan. Yusaka and Sona were both sitting together on the couch that was next to the three that were on the floor while watching TV. Sona was drinking a mug of hot tea as she and Yusaka silently watched Issei talking with both Kuno and Seraphal. Sona had her usual stoic demeanor as the Fox Queen looked very content as she adorned her trademark half-crescent smile. You can totally see the strings, oh gosh, that's terrible effects. Did you do that on purpose when recording the episode, Milky? Issei had his head aimed toward a bubbly Seraphal. Well, I wanted my show to be aired in the human world, not just the underworld. So, I had to make it look like a human production, cheap effects and all. Otherwise, the networks would get suspicious. Think about it, if we used actual magic in the TV show, it would make it look as though we had top-notch effects. Then it would look as though we had a huge budget, something akin to a multi-million back production. Seraphal then shrugs her shoulders. Nodding, Issei replies, yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Issei then nods once again while taking into account that Seraphal is very intelligent behind her facade of Milky Chan. Wow, Milky, that is really good thinking. I don't think I would have ever thought of something like that. No wonder you're a Mao. Seraphal tilts her head while her smile turns into something more serious. Issei Kun, that was so nice of you to say. You think I'm smart, eek. Instantly. Sona grows a tick mark as Yusaka begins to laugh into her sleeve, meanwhile Kuno begins to clap again. Issei now has his back to the bottom part of the couch, in between both Sona and Yusaka. On his lap was Seraphal who was hugging the teen relentlessly. The force of her sudden embrace caused Issei to slide from in front of the TV, while slamming him into the couch. Hiodo, Seraphal, stop that right this instant. Sona was pointing at the two with a shaking finger. She had a flustered yet irritated look. Era era, so much love going on this morning, how sweet. Yusaka continues to laugh into her sleeve. Seraphal was ignoring the room while continuing to relentlessly snuggle on her Issei. Ima smart girl, yay. No wonder that I'm a Mao, oh that is so sweet. Kuno was clapping along and making a song out of it all. Smart, Milky Chan, brilliant, Milky Chan, Red Knight loves Milky. Issei-kun wa Maruki-chan ga Daisuki. Maruki-chan wa Issei-kun ga Daisuki. During all of this, Issei was unable to get a single word in. As his face was pressed against Seraphal's neck and shoulders, his lungs were unable to fill with air as the Mao continued with her bone-crushing hug. 
Yasaka began to notice that the teen's face was turning a few shades pink. Reaching into her evening gown sleeve, Yasaka pulled from it, a folded paper fan. Sona noticed this and watched curiously. Looking toward the goggling Seraphal, Yasaka then used this fan to slap the Mao upside her head. Oi, hey that hurt. Seraphal now had both of her arms off of Issei as her hands were now rubbing the top of her head. At the same time, Issei took in a very deep breath of fresh air. Sona looked back at Yasaka, who was now returning the stare. Instantly, both women showed a nod of respect to one another. Issei, after catching his breath, noticed the exchange between Sona and Yasaka. For some reason, this made the teen smile. Seen Underworld, Ramori Manor. In a large office, decorated in turn of the century Victorian Gothic, was Sirzex, as he sat in his desk. He looked to be deep in thought. While scrolling through his phone, he noticed the date. Golden week. Golden week. Now pinching the bridge of his nose, the Mao continued to think deeply. Maybe I should talk to him. After all, he will be my brother soon enough. Sirzex was beginning to grow a smile, but then another thought came to mind. Well, I suppose at this point, it's all up in the air. The red-headed Grimori Mao now began to frown. Rias, I love you very much, but sometimes you can really be a... Sirzex stood from his desk while pacing the entire room. He would stop occasionally when looking at photographs of his family which were placed all over the walls. Seeing a particular picture of a younger Rias, as she was sitting with a younger Sona and Seraphal, made Sirzex feel nostalgic. He really does love his sister and knows full well that he dotes on her far too much. Though, couldn't the same be said about Seraphal and Sona? She dotes far more on her sister thought the Mao. Eureka, got it, I'll have Grafia bring him here. Then we can have some bonding time and maybe I can get him to warm back up to Rias. After all, I have her baby pictures. All right, Kyoto, after you get back from Kyoto, you and I are gonna have a one-on-one -on -one talk. Rias, once again, your big brother is going to save the day. Scene, guest room, Yusaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan. Hearing that the girls were finished in the baths, Issei and Saji would be going in next. Searching through the closet, Issei was looking for a change of clothes. To his surprise, alongside Saji's outfits were three milky spiral t-shirts. They were not just that, Issei knew that these specific shirts were collector's items and more so, very rare. And if that wasn't enough, each shirt was signed by Milky Chan. Issei was about to freak out in the best of ways, that was until he read what Seraphal wrote underneath all three of her signatures. Issei Hyodo, number one fan, property of Milky Chan. Issei wasn't sure if he should ever be caught wearing these in public. Clearly, Milky Spiral had quite a following and because of that, she had fanboys. Fanboys who were completely loyal to Milky Chan in all things. Thinking that he would surely gain attention, the wrong kind Issei thought it better to just keep these at home and never wear them. Scene, 30 minutes, den area. Sona was standing next to Tsubaki at one corner of the room as Momo, Reya, Tomo, Tsubasa, Saji and Ruruko were sitting together on the couches and chairs near the large television. Seraphal, Yasaka, Kuno and Issei looked to be sitting at a Japanese-style low table as the four were playing a game of Mahjong. Sona was watching the four interact while she adjusted her pink-rimmed glasses. Quietly, Sona whispers toward Tsubaki. I need to make my move, I've decided on that. Tsubaki widens her eyes slightly however her mannerism goes back to her usual stoic one. I see. What is your plan, President? Nodding slowly. Sona begins to form a small grin. My plan is simple. Yasaka happens to own quite the backyard garden. Dare I say, it would make a fantastic location for perhaps a picnic date. Tsubaki thinks for a moment and then retorts. I understand, President. I do have a question however. How will you get Issei alone long enough to convey your plans? Considering the current company, I would imagine that might be somewhat difficult. Sona places an index finger into the air as her smirk increases. Why Tsubaki? It's going to be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Tsubaki tilts her head. Oh really? Sona nods. Homework, of course. Tsubaki thinks for a moment. If Sona uses her student council presidential authority and claims that Issei is behind in his studies, she can therefore rip the boy away from the grasps of both Seraphal and Yasaka. 
As always, Sona was one step ahead when it came to her wits. Tsubaki then replies with great admiration. Wow, wow, wow. Great idea. Sona nods once again but then thinks of a possible snag. Well, there is that Kuno girl. She's been a bit of a thorn in my behind since day one. Tsubaki, what should I do if she gets in the way? Tsubaki looks toward the small table with the four Mahjong players and then back at Sona while she shrugs. I don't know, maybe give her candy or something. Sona starts to internally panic. Suddenly a thought struck the sea tree's brain like lightning. Reaching for her phone, Sona pulls up a photo. As her smirk turns into an all-out grin, Sona looks over toward Kuno, who is happily playing her mahjong game with the other three. Say, little Kuno, would you mind coming over here for a minute? I've got something to show you, dear. He he he. Sona then put a hand over her own mouth as she caught herself beginning to laugh in a maniacal kind of manner. Turning her head over in Sona's direction, Kuno's smile turned into a grumpy frown. Oh yeah, this better be good, mean lady. Kuno, stood from the table as Yasaka, Seraphal and Issei watched the little princess skip off into Sona's direction. Yasaka lifted an eyebrow when her eyes met with Sona's. Once the fox princess was standing next to both Sona and Tsubaki, she began to immediately tap her foot as her grumpy scowl remained. Well, Sona, who was doing everything she could not to tell this little brat off, put on a fake smile while showing her phone to the little blonde fox. Tsubaki's eyes widened at what she saw on the phone screen. This was none other than Sona's autographed Milky Spiral gold foil playing card. Tsubaki remembered when Seraphal gave this to her president on her last birthday, saying that the piece of memorabilia was only one of three ever made. Naturally, Sona didn't visually seem to care or even pay attention, but clearly, the card now has a purpose and the C3 devil was going to play. Eek, oh my, do you have one of those? Kuno is jumping up and down while eyeballing the phone screen. Sona victoriously nods. She then reaches down and whispers into the fox princess's ear as Kuno listens attentively. It's all yours. All you need to do is not interfere when I say what I say in the next few moments. Deal. Nodding overly enthusiastically, little Kuno holds out her pinky. Understanding the notion, Sona reaches for the fox princess's pinky with her own. Deal. Not quite hearing what the three were talking about in the corner, Yasaka, Seraphal and even Issei became rather suspicious. Before anything could be said, Kuno was skipping back toward the table. Once she sat down, she grabbed hold of her mahjong board and then looked back at the three onlookers. What? Kuno had a smirk on her face but was trying to look serious. Yasaka now lowers her lifted eyebrow as her smile remains. Oh, nothing, little one. Let us continue, shall we? Sona and Tsubaki are both being very quiet now as the rest of the room goes back to what it was doing. Looking toward her queen, Sona smirks. All too easy, Tsubaki, all too easy. Sona now puts her phone away and clears her throat. She does this while straightening her glasses as well as her demeanor. As Sona puts on her stern persona, Tsubaki mimics this as the two now turn their attention directly onto Issei. Hyodo, just because we are on a small vacation does not mean you may neglect your studies. Sona was now closing her eyes while speaking matter-of-factly. Hearing his name being called like that, Issei immediately stood at attention. Wait, but I did that stupid squid report already. Come on. President, don't make me. Sona then stomps her foot down. This makes Issei flinch. Don't argue with me. I have a responsibility as student council president to make sure Bakas like you don't fall behind. Kuno really wanted to say something, but she kept repeating to herself, I on the prize, I on the prize. Issei looks at Seraphal, then Yusaka and finally, Kuno. He has a defeated look plastered to his face. Sorry guys. Maybe we can play some more later tonight. Scene, moments later. Sona was walking ahead and toward their guest room as Issei Mopili walked behind. Sona then opened the sliding door as she waited for Issei to walk on through. Once he was in, she slid the door shut and took a very deep breath. Issei, how do you feel about sandwiches? Sona was now tapping the tips of both of her index fingers together as a blush began to form on her cheeks. Turning around. Issei wasn't sure what she was talking about. You mean, like while we are studying? Sona shakes her head. No, Baka, I mean, 
Do you like sandwiches? As in, maybe the two of us could, I don't know, have a picnic today in the back garden. Issei's eyes widened as clarity washed over him like a cold bucket of water. Oh, Sona, geez, you had me there for a second. Issei now plopped down on one of the chairs with a hand over his right temple. Okay, phew, yes, I love sandwiches and more so, I would love to go on a date with you. Sona's glasses immediately fogged up which forced her to remove them. Date, Issei smiles warmly, yeah, we haven't had one yet. It was something that's been on my mind actually, it's just since everything's been all kinds of crazy, I just didn't get a. Issei was cut off by a very familiar pair of lips kissing his own. As Issei closes his eyes, his arms wrap around the sea tree heiress as the two engage in a long embrace. Once the kiss was broken, Issei opened his eyes again. Hey, Sona, Sona places her fog-free glasses back on. Yes, Issei, pulling Sona closer. Issei smiles brighter than ever. Promise me that you won't ever stop being you. Sona now grows a small smirk along with her growing blush. Don't worry, Kyoto, you will always get my firm hand. Issei now instantly jumps into the air as Sona reached over and slapped his behind with her hand suddenly. Scene, one hour later, Yasaka Gardens. Walking across a curved and wooden bridge, we can see both Sona and Issei. Once again, we can see the teen wearing Saji's black yukata as Sona was wearing another kimono. Purple, blue and green, this traditional Japanese dress ended in a matching sash adorned with black butterflies. Together, the pair walked slowly as the day was absolutely stunning. Not a cloud in the sky, only the slightest spring breeze, this increased the beauty tenfold when it came to this ancient and enigmatic garden. Both were quiet as they held hands. In Issei's other arm, was a pink cloth which held a set of pearl-colored bento boxes. Sona looked to be indifferent to the situation, however the way she would continue to tighten her grip on Issei's hand told the teen everything he needed to know. She was having fun. Issei was also having fun while enjoying Sona's very sunere behavior. Then, off into the distance, past the multiple koi ponds, Issei spotted a very familiar area. His eyes widened suddenly as his smile turned into a sad one. Sona, looking at Issei's face, Sona then turned. Where the teen was looking, a clearing in the distance was visible along with a pair of rolling hills. Aside from the waves of green grass that flowed with the slight gust of wind, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Sona then turned back and looked into Issei's brown eyes while tilting her head slightly. What is it? That field over there. What about it? As Issei continued to stare off, he suddenly began to laugh quietly. Sona studied this odd behavior coming from her boyfriend. Why is he crying again? Why is he laughing? I don't understand, what does he see that I clearly don't? Looking back into that specific direction, Sona squints a bit trying to catch something she might have missed. Issei then spoke as he looked to be reminiscing about something. It's that place, Sona. The one in my dreams. It was right here, the whole time. Remembering something about a grassy field, Sona then understood. I see. Well, let's go sit under that tree over there. It looks rather comfy to be honest. Nodding, Issei pulls Sona along at a quick pace to her surprise. Chapter 26, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 26, Nerding Out to Milky Spiral. Scene, Yusaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan. Yusaka and Sona were both sitting together on the couch that was next to the three that were on the floor while watching TV. Sona was drinking a mug of hot tea as she and Yusaka silently watched Issei talking with both Kuno and Seraphal. Sona had her usual stoic demeanor as the Fox Queen looked very content as she adorned her trademark half-crescent smile. You can totally see the strings, oh gosh, that's terrible effects. Did you do that on purpose when recording the episode, Milky? Issei had his head aimed toward a bubbly Seraphal. Well, I wanted my show to be aired in the human world, not just the underworld. So, I had to make it look like a human production, cheap effects and all. Otherwise, the networks would get suspicious. Think about it, if we used actual magic in the TV show, it would make it look as though we had top-notch effects. Then it would look as though we had a huge budget, something akin to a multi-million back production. Seraphal then shrugs her shoulders. Nodding, Issei replies. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. 
Issei then nods once again while taking into account that Seraphal is very intelligent behind her facade of Milky Chan. Wow, Milky, that is really good thinking. I don't think I would have ever thought of something like that. No wonder you're a Mao. Seraphal tilts her head while her smile turns into something more serious. Issei Kun, that was so nice of you to say. You think I'm smart, eek. Instantly, Sona grows a tick mark as Yusaka begins to laugh into her sleeve, meanwhile Kuno begins to clap again. Issei now has his back to the bottom part of the couch, in between both Sona and Yusaka. On his lap was Seraphal who was hugging the teen relentlessly. The force of her sudden embrace caused Issei to slide from in front of the TV, while slamming him into the couch. Hiodo, Seraphal, stop that right this instant. Sona was pointing at the two with a shaking finger. She had a flustered yet irritated look. Era era, so much love going on this morning, how sweet. Yusaka continues to laugh into her sleeve. Seraphal was ignoring the room while continuing to relentlessly snuggle on her Issei. Ima smart girl, yay. No wonder that I'm a Mao, oh that is so sweet. Kuno was clapping along and making a song out of it all. Smart, Milky Chan, brilliant, Milky Chan, Red Knight loves Milky, Issei Kun wa Maruki Chan ga Daisuki. Maruki Chan wa Issei Kun ga Daisuki. During all of this, Issei was unable to get a single word in. As his face was pressed against Seraphal's neck and shoulders, his lungs were unable to fill with air as the Mao continued with her bone-crushing hug. Yusaka began to notice that the teen's face was turning a few shades pink. Reaching into her evening gown sleeve, Yusaka pulled from it, a folded paper fan. Sona noticed this and watched curiously. Looking toward the goggling Seraphal, Yusaka then used this fan to slap the Mao upside her head. Oi, hey that hurt. Seraphal now had both of her arms off of Issei as her hands were now rubbing the top of her head. At the same time, Issei took in a very deep breath of fresh air. Sona looked back at Yusaka, who was now returning the stare. Instantly, both women showed a nod of respect to one another. Issei, after catching his breath, noticed the exchange between Sona and Yusaka. For some reason, this made the teen smile. Scene, Underworld, Grimori Manor. In a large office, decorated in turn of the century Victorian Gothic, was Sirzex, as he sat in his desk. He looked to be deep in thought. While scrolling through his phone, he noticed the date. Golden week. Golden week. Now pinching the bridge of his nose, the Mao continued to think deeply. Maybe I should talk to him. After all, he will be my brother soon enough. Sirzex was beginning to grow a smile, but then another thought came to mind. Well, I suppose at this point, it's all up in the air. The red-headed Grimori Mao now began to frown. Rias, I love you very much, but sometimes you can really be a... Sirzek stood from his desk while pacing the entire room. He would stop occasionally when looking at photographs of his family which were placed all over the walls. Seeing a particular picture of a younger Rias, as she was sitting with a younger Sona and Seraphal, made Sirzek feel nostalgic. He really does love his sister and knows full well that he dotes on her far too much. Though, couldn't the same be said about Seraphal and Sona? She dotes far more on her sister thought the Mao. Eureka, got it, I'll have Graphia bring him here. Then we can have some bonding time and maybe I can get him to warm back up to Rias. After all, I have her baby pictures. Alright, Kyoto, after you get back from Kyoto, you and I are gonna have a one-on-one -on -one talk. Rias. Once again, your big brother is going to save the day. Scene, guest room, Yusaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan. Hearing that the girls were finished in the baths, Issei and Saji would be going in next. Searching through the closet, Issei was looking for a change of clothes. To his surprise, alongside Saji's outfits were three milky spiral t-shirts. They were not just that, Issei knew that these specific shirts were collector's items and more so, very rare. And if that wasn't enough, each shirt was signed by Milky Chan. Issei was about to freak out in the best of ways, that was until he read what Seraphal wrote underneath all three of her signatures. Issei Hiodo, number one fan, property of Milky Chan. Issei wasn't sure if he should ever be caught wearing these in public. Clearly, Milky Spiral had quite a following and because of that, she had fanboys. Fanboys who were completely loyal to Milky Chan in all things. 
Thinking that he would surely gain attention, the wrong kind Issei thought it better to just keep these at home and never wear them. Scene, 30 minutes, den area. Sona was standing next to Tsubaki at one corner of the room as Momo, Rea, Tomo, Tsubasa, Saji and Ruruko were sitting together on the couches and chairs near the large television. Serifal, Yasaka, Kuno and Issei looked to be sitting at a Japanese-style low table as the four were playing a game of Mahjong. Sona was watching the four interact while she adjusted her pink-rimmed glasses. Quietly, Sona whispers toward Tsubaki. I need to make my move, I've decided on. That, Tsubaki widens her eyes slightly however her mannerism goes back to her usual stoic one. I see. What is your plan, President? Nodding slowly, Sona begins to form a small grin. My plan is simple. Yasaka happens to own quite the backyard garden. Dare I say, it would make a fantastic location for perhaps a picnic date. Tsubaki thinks for a moment and then retorts. I understand, President. I do have a question however. How will you get Issei alone long enough to convey your plans? Considering the current company, I would imagine that might be somewhat difficult. Sona places an index finger into the air as her smirk increases. Why Tsubaki? It's going to be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Tsubaki tilts her head. Oh really? Sona nods. Homework, of course. Tsubaki thinks for a moment. If Sona uses her student council presidential authority and claims that Issei is behind in his studies, she can therefore rip the boy away from the grasps of both Serifal and Yasaka. As always, Sona was one step ahead when it came to her wits. Tsubaki then replies with great admiration. Wow, wow, wow. Great idea. Sona nods once again but then thinks of a possible snag. Well, there is that Kuno girl. She's been a bit of a thorn in my behind since day one. Tsubaki, what should I do if she gets in the way? Tsubaki looks toward the small table with the four Mahjong players and then back at Sona while she shrugs. I don't know, maybe give her candy or something. Sona starts to internally panic. Suddenly a thought struck the sea tree's brain like lightning. Reaching for her phone, Sona pulls up a photo. As her smirk turns into an all-out grin, Sona looks over toward Kuno, who is happily playing her Mahjong game with the other three. Say, little Kuno, would you mind coming over here for a minute? I've got something to show you, dear. He he he. Sona then put a hand over her own mouth as she caught herself beginning to laugh in a maniacal kind of manner. Turning her head over in Sona's direction, Kuno's smile turned into a grumpy frown. Oh yeah, this better be good, mean lady. Kuno stood from the table as Yasaka, Serifal and Issei watched the little princess skip off into Sona's direction. Yasaka lifted an eyebrow when her eyes met with Sona's. Once the fox princess was standing next to both Sona and Tsubaki, she began to immediately tap her foot as her grumpy scowl remained. Well, Sona, who was doing everything she could not to tell this little brat off put on a fake smile while showing her phone to the little blonde fox. Tsubaki's eyes widened at what she saw on the phone screen. This was none other than Sona's autographed milky spiral gold foil playing card. Tsubaki remembered when Serifal gave this to her president on her last birthday, saying that the piece of memorabilia was only one of three ever made. Naturally, Sona didn't visually seem to care or even pay attention, but clearly, the card now has a purpose and the C3 devil was going to play. Eek. Oh my. Do you have one of those? Kuno is jumping up and down while eyeballing the phone screen. Sona victoriously nods. She then reaches down and whispers into the fox princess's ear as Kuno listens attentively. It's all yours. All you need to do is not interfere when I say what I say in the next few moments. Deal. Nodding overly enthusiastically, little Kuno holds out her pinky. Understanding the notion, Sona reaches for the fox princess's pinky with her own. Deal. Not quite hearing what the three were talking about in the corner, Yasaka, Serifal and even Issei became rather suspicious. Before anything could be said, Kuno was skipping back toward the table. Once she sat down, she grabbed hold of her mahjong board and then looked back at the three. Onlookers. What? Kuno had a smirk on her face but was trying to look serious. Yasaka now lowers her lifted eyebrow as her smile remains. Oh. Nothing, little one. Let us continue, shall we? Sona and Tsubaki are both being very quiet now as the rest of the room goes back to what it was doing. 
looking toward her queen, Sona smirks. All too easy, Tsubaki, all too easy. Sona now puts her phone away and clears her throat. She does this while straightening her glasses as well as her demeanor. As Sona puts on her stern persona, Tsubaki mimics this as the two now turn their attention directly onto Issei. Hyodo, just because we are on a small vacation does not mean you may neglect your studies. Sona was now closing her eyes while speaking matter-of-factly. Hearing his name being called like that, Issei immediately stood at attention. Wait, but I did that stupid squid report already. Come on, president, don't make me. Sona then stomps her foot down. This makes Issei flinch. Don't argue with me, I have a responsibility as student council president to make sure Bakas like you don't fall behind. Kuno really wanted to say something, but she kept repeating to herself, eye on the prize, eye on the prize. Issei looks at Seraphal, then Yusaka and finally, Kuno. He has a defeated look plastered to his face. Sorry guys, maybe we can play some more later tonight. Scene, moments later. Sona was walking ahead and toward their guest room as Issei Mopili walked behind. Sona then opened the sliding door as she waited for Issei to walk on through. Once he was in, she slid the door shut and took a very deep breath. Issei, how do you feel about sandwiches? Sona was now tapping the tips of both of her index fingers together as a blush began to form on her cheeks. Turning around, Issei wasn't sure what she was talking about. You mean, like while we are studying? Sona shakes her head, no, Baka, I mean, do you like sandwiches, as in, maybe the two of us could, I don't know, have a picnic today in the back garden. Issei's eyes widened as clarity washed over him like a cold bucket of water. Oh, Sona, geez, you had me there for a second. Issei now plopped down on one of the chairs with a hand over his right temple. Okay, phew, yes, I love sandwiches and more so, I would love to go on a date with you. Sona's glasses immediately fogged up which forced her to remove them. Date. Issei smiles warmly. Yeah, we haven't had one yet. It was something that's been on my mind actually, it's just since everything's been all kinds of crazy, I just didn't get a. Issei was cut off by a very familiar pair of lips kissing his own. As Issei closes his eyes, his arms wrap around the sea tree heiress as the two engage in a long embrace. Once the kiss was broken, Issei opened his eyes again. Hey, Sona, Sona places her fog-free glasses back on. Yes, Issei, pulling Sona closer, Issei smiles brighter than ever. Promise me that you won't ever stop being you. Sona now grows a small smirk along with her growing blush. Don't worry, Hyodo, you will always get my firm hand. Issei now instantly jumps into the air as Sona reached over and slapped his behind with her hand suddenly. Scene, one hour later, Yusaka Gardens. Walking across a curved and wooden bridge, we can see both Sona and Issei. Once again, we can see the teen wearing Saji's black yukata as Sona was wearing another kimono. Purple, blue and green, this traditional Japanese dress ended in a matching sash adorned with black butterflies. Together, the pair walked slowly as the day was absolutely stunning. Not a cloud in the sky, only the slightest spring breeze, this increased the beauty tenfold when it came to this ancient and enigmatic garden. Both were quiet as they held hands. In Issei's other arm was a pink cloth which held a set of pearl-colored bento boxes. Sona looked to be indifferent to the situation, however the way she would continue to tighten her grip on Issei's hand told the teen everything he needed to know. She was having fun. Issei was also having fun while enjoying Sona's very sunere behavior. Then, off into the distance, past the multiple koi ponds, Issei spotted a very familiar area. His eyes widened suddenly as his smile turned into a sad one. Sona, looking at Issei's face, Sona then turned where the teen was looking. A clearing in the distance was visible along with a pair of rolling hills. Aside from the waves of green grass that flowed with the slight gust of wind, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Sona then turned back and looked into Issei's brown eyes while tilting her head slightly. What is it? That field over there. What about it? As Issei continued to stare off, he suddenly began to laugh quietly. Sona studied this odd behavior coming from her boyfriend. Why is he crying again? Why is he laughing? I don't understand, what does he see that I clearly don't? Looking back into that specific direction, Sona squints a bit trying to catch something she might have missed. 
Issei then spoke as he looked to be reminiscing about something. It's that place, Sona. The one in my dreams. It was right here, the whole time. Remembering something about a grassy field, Sona then understood. I see. Well, let's go sit under that tree over there. It looks rather comfy to be honest. Nodding, Issei pulls Sona along at a quick pace to her surprise. Chapter 27, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazzle. Chapter 27, A String of Red Yarn. Scene, Kuo Academy. Rias can be seen, using a large broom to sweep up stray leaves and dirt from the school's track and field. She looks to be working very hard as beads of sweat fall from the redhead's face. Rias continued to sweep as thought ran through her mind. When I finally tell him that we are going to be married, I am sure Issei will see reason. Hindsight, I really should have been closer with him, especially after everything with Riser. Maybe I should have just been straight up with him, after the talk with my brother, I should have just told him that I love him. But my stupid pride and selfishness caused a great rift in our relationship, I see that now. Well, as long as he doesn't learn about that one time, I think I will be able to fix this. Just a little longer, my love, then I will heal that broken heart of yours. Rias was immediately drawn from her thoughts when a voice was heard over her shoulder. Rias, Rias, time to play. As the Grimori heiress's hair began to stand on its own, Rias made a beeline toward the rear entrance of the school as she screamed bloody murder. No, Grafia, seen Yusaka Castle, the gardens. Issei was leading Sona toward the place of his recent dreams. He was trying to keep his composure while sniffling back his tears. Sona continued to stare at the back of Issei's head. She was very concerned with her boyfriend's behavior just now. Moving her attention to the upcoming field, Sona was wondering what the connection was. Issei stopped pulling once he stood under a large cherry tree. It was the same tree he was leaning against in his dream. Here it was, here in the waking world, it was surreal. Placing the bentos that were wrapped in pink cloth down on the grass, Issei then put his hand on this Sakura tree. Sona watched this while raising an eyebrow. For almost a minute, Issei just stood still with his hand still on the tree. Sona spoke up while gripping tighter with her fingers while they were in Issei's. Issei, coming out from his deep thoughts, Issei turns his head. He is, smiling so very happily. Sona, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, um, want to eat lunch here. Seeing his face finally, Sona uses her free hand to wipe Issei's eyes off with a handkerchief. Whatever you'd like, Issei. How about we sit down for a bit? Nodding, the couple both lean against the large cherry blossom tree as their legs rest comfortably in the incredible soft grass. After a bit of silence Sona then begins to disassemble the bento boxes while preparing for a meal. Meanwhile, Issei just stares off into the field while enjoying the slight breeze against his hair. Issei, how are you holding up? Sona was pouring tea into a mug. Turning his toward Sona, Issei replies. To be perfectly honest, after that strange contract with the crow, seeing what he was, well, I'm dealing. Sona hands Issei a mug of hot tea. That's natural, Issei, considering your first experience with them. Issei's smile turns into a frown as he shakes his head. What's, natural, about completely losing my shit the moment I see another one of those things? Sona, I saw R, Rainer when he showed those ugly fucking wings. Sona nods while adjusting her glasses. It's called post-traumatic stress disorder, Issei. Believe it or not, many devils, angels and fallen alike, the ones who were involved in the first biblical war, well, to this very day, many of them still cope with their traumatic pasts. Taking a sip of her tea, the sea tree heiress continues. Keep in mind, the biblical war was ages ago, but your trauma happened less than a year ago. So, when I say that your actions were natural, I meant it. Issei tilts his head while processing what Sona was conveying. Deciding that the lunch wasn't going to eat itself, Sona proceeded to grab a sandwich and take a bite. Lishin, Ishe, Sona immediately took a large gulp of her tea. Erm, listen, Issei. I'm going to tell you something that I haven't told anybody. Issei nodded in all seriousness. You can tell me anything, Sona, I won't repeat anything you want me to keep confidential, you have my word. Blushing for a moment, Sona recollects her thoughts and continues where she left off. My sister, 
Well, she also has had her bouts with trauma. I don't know all of the details, but there is a reason she has the reputation she has. And I am not talking about the milky spiral either. I've never really thought too deeply about it, like, I know people are scared of her and stuff, but I don't know why. Issei was scratching the back of his head while smiling nervously. Nodding, Sona takes another bite of her sandwich while pointing at the bento box. Seeing the gesture, Issei takes part in lunch as well. After finishing another gulp of her tea, Sona continued. Seraphal Leviathan was born Seraphal Citri, her name changed the moment she became a prodigy in her own right. Born with unrivaled control of the elements mainly consisting of water and ice magic, Seraphal became an S-class devil at the age of only 12. She took part in many campaigns for the Old Mao faction. If you want to learn more about the Old Mao, I'll tell you another time. My point is that Seraphal herself was able to tip the balance of power to whomever was ruling at the time, assuming they had her working for them. Because of this notoriety, my parents kept my older sister at arm's length. To my memory, she's never really had any friends to speak of. Issei interrupts in all seriousness. Sona, you love your sister very much. That's very sweet. Sona now chokes on her tea as the Citri heiress forms a tick mark on her forehead. Seraphal is nothing more than a thorn in my ass. Always doing things that are inappropriate. Immature, magical girl nonsense, she drives me nuts. Issei bursts out laughing. Ha ha ha. Sona, you are so fucking cute right now. Ha ha ha. Sona begins to scowl at the laughing teen. Shut up. Baka. Scene Family Den of Yasaka Castle. Achoo. Uh achoo. Uh Seraphal was sitting in the living room while watching the news on the television. She was interrupted by a plethora of invading, sneeze monsters, as she called them. Achoo. Uh okay. Who is talking about Milky right now? Seraphal looks around the room, only to see Sona's peerage, all playing mahjong. Saji smirks as he replies. I bet it's Dragon Boy. I think I saw him and the president out in the backyard before sitting down. Momo then steps on his foot under the table. Shut up. Saji. Ruruko proceeds to giggle. Seraphal Sama, you should go investigate. Who knows what the president might be up to. Seraphal stands up while nodding. Yes. Saji-san and Ruruko-chan are right. My Satan might be trying to get one up on me. Momo then steps on Ruruko's foot this time. Bakas. Scene, backyard garden. Walking across her curved and wooden bridge that connected in between a pond of koi fish, Yusaka looked to be deep in thought. She was once again dressed in her usual attire which was a golden kimono with the black slash adorned with skulls. She then stopped walking suddenly, when she spotted the sea tree devil alongside Issei. Seeing that her interest was laughing heartily, this brought joy into the Fox Queen's heart. Deciding that this was the time, Yusaka frowned for a moment while shaking her head momentarily, only for her face to reveal a loving smile as he began to raise her arm into the air. Closing her hand into a fist, Yusaka only extends her pinky finger outward. Instantly a very thin and translucent red-colored fiber began to manifest itself around the woman's finger. Closing her golden eyes, Yusaka begins to chant. Kiite ker, daichi to ten no seire yo. Watashi wa yasukateri, tamashi o shiburu gishiki o kaishi suru yo ni meijimasu. Unmei no akai ito yo ean no hanryo o sukame. Yusaka then pointed her pinky finger in the direction of Issei Hiyodo. The slight breeze now carries this very thin and hardly noticeable red string. As Issei continued to laugh at Sona's sunere tendencies, the teen noticed what felt like a bit of hair stuck to his lips. Pulling what he thought must have been either a spider's web or actual hair from his mouth, Issei was surprised to see a thin and red-colored string. Tilting his head, he realized that this string was very long as it looked as though the other end was somewhere back behind the bridge. Sona also looked curious and was trying to adjust her glasses for a better view. Instantly, the string came to life as it jumped from Issei's hand and looked as though it was a coiled snake, ready to strike. Then, it did just that, in the form of wrapping itself tightly around Issei's extended pinky finger. It's got me, Sona help. Issei stood from his spot while tugging at the string. He looked incredibly flustered as he continued to pull and then chew on this relentless string. Get off. Sona was also standing while attempting to help Issei get this thing off of him. Then, 
A bright and red flash followed up with a small blast of energy, knocking both Sona and Issei on their butts. After a moment, both teens sat up and looked at each other. Worried, Issei looked toward his hand only to see nothing there. Standing suddenly, Issei looked around the field and the gardens. The string had vanished. Looking down now, Issei saw a confused Sona. Offering his hand, the sea tree heiress takes hold and is helped to her feet. Then the two search their surroundings with their eyes. What the hell was that, Sona? Issei was still looking around very scrupulously. I haven't got a clue. Maybe it was some kind of prank. Sona was also trying to spot anything out of the ordinary. Then the two jumped suddenly. Era era. Both Sona and Issei now look behind them. Leaning against the same tree they were earlier, Yusaka now stood. She was wearing a pure white kimono which exposed a great deal of her chest. Holding onto a bouquet of red roses, Yusaka's golden tails were fluttering wildly. Issei took a deep breath. Oh, hey, Yusaka-san. You look, erm, um, very pretty. The teen then took a large gulp as he smiled nervously. Sona noticed this and puffed her cheeks out. Issei, stop docking. Shaking his head, Issei then started to rub the back of his head. Sorry president, hee hee. Yusaka then blushes deeply. Issei, come over here, please. Tilting his head, Issei then nods. Okay. Seeing the strange look on Yusaka's face, not to mention that equally strange red string, Sona knew something was up. She then places a hand on Issei's shoulder, which stops him going forward. Yusaka-sama, may I ask a question? Sona adjusts her glasses with her free hand while focusing on Yusaka's current outfit. Why are you wearing a wedding kimono? There you are, so tan, nice try. Trying to get a few points in with my Issei while I wasn't paying attention, boo, not cool, little sister, not cool. Seraphal materialized in a teleportation circle in between Sona, Issei and Yusaka. Noticing that her childhood friend was dressed for a wedding, Seraphal tilts her head. Yusaka-chan, why are you cosplaying this early in the morning? Yusaka begins to laugh into her sleeve. Foo 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 foo. Seraphal, I am married. Seraphal looks around the garden with a look of shock. You got hitched. Oh wow. Okay where is the lucky man? Sona's worried look grows to unproportional lengths. Issei grows a frown as he was a bit shocked to hear that this MILF queen was already taken. Seraphal had a look of complete glee as she continued to scan the garden for anyone. Yusaka then raises her sleeved arm while extending her pinky finger. The moment this happens, Issei's arm is forced in front of him. Sona looks at both Issei and then Yusaka. Using her other arm, the sea tree devil assumes the worst and reaches hold of Issei's other shoulder. Now with both of her hands on each of his shoulders, Sona notices Issei moving forward. Stop moving, Baka, Sona was now struggling to keep her boyfriend in place. Issei looks behind his shoulder while grimacing. Sona, I'm not moving. Looking toward Issei's feet, Sona could see indeed that he was actually being pulled by something as track marks were visible. Looking back toward Yusaka, Sona scowls. You, stop that right now, no, bad, stop. Yusaka then showed the slightest of smirks as she waved her pinky finger in the slightest gesture. Instantly, Sona lost her grasp as Issei was airborne and headed directly toward the Fox Queen. Fu 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 fu. Hello my husband. Yusaka was now holding Issei's head into her chest as the rest of the boy's body was completely covered in all nine of the Fox Queen's golden tails. Sona now pointed toward the scene in front of her as her jaw went agape. No. Seraphal had a look of surprise which turned into a large smile. Instantly, the mouse started to clap. Oh good for you, Yusaka-chan. Issei-kun is a wonderful choice. Sona turns her attention toward her sister. What the hell is wrong with you? She, this, this fox, just took our Issei. Seraphal grins back at her sister. Oh, so you've accepted that Issei belongs to both of us now. Very interesting, so tan. Hee <laughs> hee. Don't worry though, Yusaka-chan knows she must share, right? Yusaka cuddles a half-suffocating Issei while nodding. Era era era. Such a good boy. Chapter 28, Sona's Chance. A high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 28, A Fox's Wedding and Breast Talk. Scene, Yusaka Castle, Backyard. Gardens. Managing to squirm in such a way as he was able to finally get a word in. 
Issei speaks quickly as Yasaka's assets threaten to suffocate him once again at any moment. Wait, how am I married? I'm only a high schooler. MMMMPPPPHHHHH. Yasaka was blushing deeply as she then threw her bouquet of roses into the air. That simple action moved one of the Fox Queen's large breasts back into Issei's face, muffling the teen. Catching the bouquet was none other than Sona, as it simply fell into her arms. Seraphal began to clap loudly as her smile grew to ungodly proportions. Sona on the other hand, was not happy at all, not even in the slightest. As her face began to turn a few shades of red, Sona proceeded to toss the bouquet at her sister's face. I hate this, Seraphal, this is somehow your fault. As Seraphal happily catches the flowers, Sona then turns her scowl toward a jitty Yasaka. She then points once again toward the despicable display in front of her. And, you, release Issei right this very instant. While Sona was flipping out, she failed to notice that Yasaka released one of her many tails, only for said tail to slowly reach and wrap itself around Sona's extending arm. Before the sea tree heiress could react, she found herself being pulled into the air and toward one of Yasaka's open arms. No, Sona screamed only to be muffled shortly after. Yasaka now had both Sona and Issei, bound together in all nine of her golden tails. Meanwhile, she holds both teens' heads to her chest while crying happy tears. Era era, don't worry little Sona Tan, I won't interfere with your advances on my husband. We can all be one happy family. Yasaka then turns her attention toward an equally happily crying Seraphal. Isn't that right, Sarah Tan? Sona and Issei both shuddered as Seraphal came running at full speed toward the two captives, only to suffer the bone-crushing hug of the Mal Leviathan. Yay, this is so wonderful. What a great day. And Issei Kun, I may or may not have heard that you wanted your very own harem, isn't that right? Seraphal tightens left arm which squeezes Issei ever tighter. Looks like you are on a great start. Sona struggles in her fox tail prison, only to squirm against a very discombobulated Issei. No harems. Meanwhile, Issei thinks about Seraphal's words. Dear lord in hell, she's right. Holy shit, Milky is right. My dreams are finally coming true. Sona notices Issei beginning to show his trademark lecherous look and decides to put a stop to this instantly right here and now. Closing her eyes, Sona begins to chant quietly. While Seraphal was still hugging the, tailed, teens, she noticed a drop of water on her face. Looking up, the Mao's jaw dropped. Above the four, was a large blob of water, slowly getting larger by the second. Seconds later, Yasaka, Seraphal and Issei all scream as they get pummeled by the large sphere of ice-cold water. The force of the water was enough to knock everyone onto the ground which was exactly what Sona wanted. Though she was now wet too, it didn't matter, she was free of the insanity that was her sister and Yasaka. Yasaka stood up while looking down at her dress. Oh my! Era era! Issei was the first to notice as the fox queen's white kimono seemed to have loosened after being soaked. As his nose began to bleed, Issei was treated to a pair of exposed, wet and very glorious opai. Seraphal sat up while giggling as she shook her wet hair into the air. Sona looked around for a moment, only to see Yasaka fanning herself off while her breasts were exposed. Immediately, Sona turned toward Issei. Sure enough, he saw and was continuing to see. Reaching over, Sona placed both of her hands over Issei's eyes. Hey, what the hell? Sona, Issei had his hands in the air. Sona gritted her teeth. Issei Hyodo, your nose is bleeding and I know what that means. Back to the house, move it, mister. Seraphal protests. Wait, you can't just take him away like that. Besides, we need to do a reception or something. Yeah, we can have a party. Yasaka giggles. Don't be so serious, Sona Tan. After all, I don't mind if my husband sees me like this. Sona puffs her cheeks out. Don't call him that. Shortly after, Sona prods Issei back toward the bridge while she marches in a strange militaristic way. Both Seraphal and Yasaka laugh together which makes Sona blush in anger as she can still hear them in the distance. Issei decides that this whole situation is amazing and the fact that Sona is totally being a Sunere about it, well, that makes it even better. To Sona's surprise, Issei squeezes her hand. Stopping for a moment, Sona turns around, only for Issei to smile brightly at her. Sona, 
I am totally surprised by all of this, I really am. So, don't think for a second that I had anything to do with it. Issei then nods while looking directly into Sona's violet eyes. Taking a moment, Sona looks for anything that might suggest a lie. Not seeing anything, Sona then nods, though her face still maintains a slight scowl. Still smiling, Issei then speaks what's on his mind. Also, how is it that I am married? That makes no sense. It's not like we did any vows or anything, so what in the actual hell? Sona now begins to piece together the moments that happened before this strange and extraordinary event. Then something came to mind. Issei, have you ever heard of the red string of fate? Issei's eyes widened at the sudden question. Wait, you aren't saying what I think you're saying, are you? Sona nods as her mannerism turns into her usual stoic and deductive one. Adjusting her glasses, Sona explains. Well, according to Shinto folktale, which you should have paid more attention in your class in their Inari form, Kitsune symbolize good harvests, tea and sake, fertility and prosperity, cunning and smarts, business and money, all in equal measures and all at different turns. Naturally, we know Kitsune to be more than folktale. With that, there are also stories, involving Kitsune and the red string of fate. Issei, I believe you unknowingly took part in what's called. Issei cut the sea tree heiress off once he remembered something from classes involving Kitsune. A fox's wedding, Sona raised an eyebrow however she nodded. Correct, Hyodo, good job. Issei rubs the back of his head while smiling. Thanks, President. Issei then winks which makes Sona blush. Issei then shows a serious look. So, what should I, Erm, what should we do now? Sona then shows a grumpy scowl once again. First things first, I'm cold and wet, you and I, Erm. Sona begins to blush now. We are going, to um. Issei understands where this is going and smiles. To take a bath, together. Sona now tugs on Issei's arm forcing him to jog along. Shut up. Baka, scene, baths. Sona was sitting in a large hot pool. Steam permeated the room as Sona had her eyes closed. She then grew a tick mark. Hyodo, what's taking you so long? Sona then lowered her mouth into the water while bubbles floated up. From the washing hoses, Issei raised his voice while replying. Are you absolutely sure about this? I mean, what if someone walks in, I just don't want you to get all embarrassed. Issei got only one response. Lifting her chin from the green water, Sona ordered. Get in or else. Yes ma'am. Issei ran with his towel wrapped around his waist. Once he was at the pool, he saw that Sona had her back to him. Sit here and don't make another fuss about it, Issei. Sona sounded softer this time. She was also pointing directly next to her. Issei took a deep breath and slowly got into the steamy water. Once in, he did what he was asked. After a few minutes of silence, Sona then cleared her throat. Issei turned and looked back at her. She had a small smile along with a blush. Then the teen noticed that Sona was not wearing a towel as he did his very best to keep his eyes trained on those violent beauties rather than the petite and perky beauties that were her breasts. Deciding that this was the moment, Issei raises one of his arms and proceeds to place it around Sona's shoulder while pulling her closer. Sona's eyes now widened in complete shock but she couldn't complain, not even a bit, this was exactly what she needed right now. After resting against her boyfriend for a bit, Sona then looks up only to see Issei's warm eyes staring back at her. Sona thinks about her words very carefully as she feels she needs to convey something important. Issei, I know you are into, you know, girls with large, B, B, B. Issei tilts his head, boobs. Sona grinds her teeth however she nods. Issei thinks for a minute. Instantly he facepalms. Well, I mean, I guess I have a bit of a reputation considering my past actions. So yeah, I guess you could say that. I can't help it, I love boobs. Sona lowers her head while trying not to get upset. Issei then scratches the back of his slightly wet hair. To be perfectly honest with you though, size doesn't matter. I think petite chests have their own special qualities that larger ones don't and vice versa. As I said, I can't help it, I love boobs. Sona raises her head a bit. You're just saying that to be nice. Issei denies Sona's assumption immediately with great vigor. Wrong. Your boobs are amazing, Sona. I truly enjoy being spoiled by you. It's actually different from, well, 
Sona looks back at Issei's face as he now looks to be staring off into the vast layers of steam. Blushing deeply, however looking a bit concerned, Sona replies. Different from. Issei answers without hesitation. From Rias. Sona tilts her head confusingly. Now I know you're bullshitting me, Kyoto. Issei shakes his head matter-of-factly. With you, I feel like I am loved. But, with her, Sona's jaw went agape. Coming to her senses, the sea tree heiress turns to her right and hugs her heart-opening boyfriend with great intensity. Taking a moment from the sudden change of events, Issei slowly reciprocated the hug. Sona nervously chuckles while trying to hold back some tears. Hee hee, Issei, you baka, I thought we were just talking about breast preferences. You should feel loved, moron. As the two continued their embrace, Seraphal was watching from a communication circle that she had manifested above the couple's head. She was sitting in the family den area of the castle as Yusaka was sitting next to her on a couch. The two had towels wrapped in their damp hair as each woman was now wearing a pink bathrobe. Seraphal then smiled brightly. That's my Satan. Such a good girl. I am really thankful she found Issei, even though it wasn't the best of circumstances. Yusaka nods while frowning a bit. Seraphal, I need to tell you something. I only found out once my soul resonated with the Hyodo boy. I didn't believe it at first, but now, I am sure. Seraphal looks toward her childhood friend and nods as she places a supportive hand into the Fox Queens. What's up, Yusaka-chan? Yusaka starts to cry. Issei, I now know that he is a descendant of Asuma Hayasaka. Seraphal's blue eyes widened in realization. Kuno's father. Really? Yusaka nods. Even from the heavens, Asuma grants me another miracle. The poor broken man, he blessed me with Issei. There is no such thing as coincidence in this world, Seraphal. Everything follows a specific path in a very specific pattern. Much like the ley lines that flow. Through this city and through me, fate also works in a similar fashion. It runs throughout our lives, as though a paved path is always directly in front of us. Whether you choose to walk that path is irrelevant, for fate has already decided. Yusaka now closes her golden eyes as tears fall from her cheeks. Seraphal also closes her eyes while tightening her grip on Yusaka's hand. You need to tell this to Issei. Yusaka nods. Yes. Seraphal, bring Issei to me tonight, in my chambers. I want to introduce him to his descendant and tell him the story of Kuno's father. Seraphal smiles brightly while making a magical girl salute with her free hand. You can count on me. Now, stop crying. As I told you earlier, Issei is a good boy, he will understand. Scene, Kuo Academy. No I am not making this up. Graphia, clearly something is going on here. Rias had her arms folded as she looked rather pale and paranoid. Graphia, who was standing near the bleachers of the track and field, looked to her left and then to her right. She maintained a stoic demeanor even though she thought this was beginning to become rather funny. I don't see any. Ghosts. Rias. Perhaps you aren't taking vitamins and are deficient in something. Rias stomps her foot down as a tick mark forms on her forehead. It calls me by my name. It knows me. Graphia. Does this have something to do with my punishment? Tell me now. Graphia is doing her absolute best to keep her composure. She then turns her back on Rias and starts to walk toward the school. She is now smiling while placing a single hand over her mouth. Then she takes a deep breath. Removing her hand, right before she walked into the building, Graphia declared. There's no ghosts here, Rias, get back to work. Well that's all for now see you in the next part.